All right, so uh, this webinar is going to be um, divided into three sections. Upon completion of this webinar, uh, attendees will be able to describe the factors, uh, describe the factors and equipment available in an occupational setting to help reduce radiation exposure, differentiate between primary and secondary barriers and provide specifications for design, identify sources of radiation uh, dose to the radiographer, explain the inverse square law, define the terms controlled and uncontrolled areas in radiologic facilities, what factors determine the classification and what conditions must be met for these areas. Our first section will cover sources of exposure to radiographers and general practices for the radiographer to reduce occupational doses of radiation. In the beginning of this module, you will mainly, we will mainly explain the fundamental principles of protection and define what scatter and leakage radiations are and how to reduce their effect on occupational dose. We will review protective barriers in the equipment and in, and in construction of the work area as it relates to occupational safety. There are five, I'm sorry, there are three guiding principles in radiation protection time, distance, and shielding. These are derived from the principle of ALARA. ALARA stands for as low as reasonably achievable. Exposure to radiation is an occupational hazard. We know that based on stochastic effects, there is no safe dose. And we know that for most radiographers, it is impossible to eliminate all exposure to radiation. The best that we can do is minimize the amount of radiation we are exposed to on a daily basis. Time is important. For most examinations, the radiographer is not in the room while the x-ray production is activated. However, exams like OR procedures, fluoroscopy, excuse me, fluoroscopy procedures, and some mobile imaging, they do require that the technologist be in the room during the radiographic study. When possible, the radiographer should decrease the time they are in the room. Time is directly proportional to dose. This means that if the time one spends in the room during active production of radiation, the dose that has been received is double. Likely, or sorry, likewise, if the time is cut in half, the dose is cut in half. Another consideration is repeat images on patients. <clears throat> if a patient has an exam consisting of two images and both images need to be repeated, the patient dose is doubled, but so does the amount of scatter received by the technologist. We'll talk more about scatter radiation in a little bit, but for now, it is the largest contributor to the occupational radiation exposure. The dose of radiation is indirectly proportional to the square of the distance. This means if the distance is doubled from the source of radiation, the dose will be cut by four times or cut to one fourth of the original dose. You may recall this is also, this is also true for receptor exposure and beam intensity. This is also true of the scatter radiation received by the technologist. Distance is the most effective method to reduce radiation dose. Let's refer back to time. With time, if the time in the room is cut by a factor of two, the radiation exposure is cut by a factor of two because they are directly proportional. If the distance is increased by a factor of two, the radiation exposure is cut by a factor of four meaning that the reduction in dose is twice that of the reduction, reduction with time. As a review, here is the inverse square law formula. Intensity is the same as exposure, which determines radiation absorbed dose, which is given in milligray. We can substitute milligray into this formula by replacing the intensity. The formula reads intensity one over intensity two is equal to distance two squared over distance one squared. And I'm sure you all remember that. It was uh, drummed into our heads in radiography school. Let's plug in some numbers here. 
So if the radiation dose during a fluoroscopic exam is two milligray, if the technologist stands two feet from the patient, what is the dose if the technologist moves to a spot six feet from the patient? We set the formula up and calculate the squares of the distances given and plug, uh, plug in the information that we have. The formula would read two milligray over X is equal to 36 over four. When we cross multiply, we have 36 X equals eight milligray. Now divide. 36 divided by eight is uh, 0 0.22. Therefore, the new dose received at six feet from the patient is 0.22 milligray. That's quite a reduction of radiation dose. A clue to check yourself when setting up this formula is to look at your final answer. If you moved further away from the patient, your answer should be smaller than the original dose. Did you move closer to the patient? In that case, your answer, sh answer should be higher than the original dose. Next is shielding. The room, the equipment, and the occupational workers must all be shielded with material that acts as an absor absorber. Various materials can be used as an absorber. As much radiation, excuse me. The material is given in lead equivalency, however, which means the amount of material required to absorb as much radiation as a given thickness of lead. Lead is not always the material used, mostly due to cost and to weight. We're going to talk about the various types of shielding I have mentioned here on future slides. Just understand the purpose of the shielding is to keep the dose to a LARA by absorbing radiation. Also, shielding absorbs most of the scatter but is not the most effective method of radiation protection because shielding does not cover the entire body of the radiation worker. Before we get into the types of shielding, let's review the sources of scatter and leakage radiation. There are two types of scatter, there are two types of scatter radiation when the X-ray photons interact with objects or material, and that includes our patient. Coherent and Compton. Compton scatter is the largest source of exposure to the diagnostic radiographer. The largest source of scatter radiation is the patient. Other sources of scatter radiation include the x-ray table, upright stand, and any walls from which scatter can ricochet. Photons that have scattered 90 degrees and one meter or three feet from the scattering object are only about one one thousandth as intense as the primary beam. Therefore, distance and shielding such as lead aprons are your friends. Use them as needed to minimize the scatter dose to you, meaning uh, in fluoroscopy, in the OR, and also on portables too. One of the most important use most important and useful tools the radiographer has at his or her disposal is collimation. This webinar is about occupational safety, but this is true for patient safety as well. Not only does collimation reduce the area of tissue exposed um, on the patient, thereby reducing the patient dose, but scatter production decreases as well, which reduces occupational dose. A reduction in beam size decreases the quantity of, X, of photons available to undergo Compton scattering, which reduces the occupational exposure. Filtration in the form of aluminum or some other material is effective as, some of the material as effective as aluminum is used to remove low energy X-ray photons from the beam. Although intended primarily to reduce patient skin dose, the removal of low energy X-ray photons from the primary beam also reduces the amount of scatter production that can take place. Since scatter radiation contributes to occupational dose, the use of filtration therefore reduces the occupational dose. So we just discussed scatter radiation. 
Scatter is a form of secondary radiation. Another type of secondary radiation is leakage radiation or off-focus radiation. When x-rays are produced, the majority of the x-rays are directed through the window and towards the patient. Leakage radiation is radiation that is leaving the x-ray tube in a direction other than the intended direction through the window. The x-ray tube housing should be able to limit the amount of leakage radiation from which the technologist can be exposed. Regulations in the United States stipulate that leakage radiation must not exceed one milligray per hour at a distance of one meter from the source when operating at the maximum potential and current. Lead aprons must be worn when the radiographer cannot stand behind a lead barrier. Lead aprons should have a minimum lead content, lead equivalent content um, of about 0.5 millimeters. Lead gloves, 0.25 millimeters of lead equivalent are worn if the hands may be placed in the fluoroscopic beam and require the same equivalent lead content. Also available are lead thyroid shields and glasses. Those who work in areas uh, where extensive fluoroscopy um, is a concern can use a thyroid shield consisting of 0.5 millimeters of lead shielding. Also available are lead glass eyewear, which provide 0.35 millimeters of lead equivalent protection. Table-side fluoroscopy can prove hazardous if the Bucky slot, um, Bucky slot cover is not available. The Bucky slot cover should be 0.25 millimeters of lead equivalent at a minimum. The Bucky slot cover presents scatter radiation from exposing the fluoroscopist gonadal area. The fluoro carriage is also equipped with a drape, which is 0.25 millimeters of lead equivalent. This drape will block scatter from the patient and protect the fluoroscopist and others that are in the room, including the radiographer. There is a device which can be worn at the waist or neck outside of the apron, which assists uh, the user to minimize exposure. This is not a protective device as it does not shield. Its effectiveness depends on the user and that is your fluoroscopy monitor. We'll talk more about that type, those types of things a little later. In the medical setting, it's easy for protective apparel to get dirty. If your x-ray apron, apron is dirty from blood or other bodily fluids, you should clean it as soon as possible. It is recommended to use cold water and a mild detergent and carefully wipe down the x-ray apron. Do not use bleach or any other harsh chemicals because they can deteriorate the effectiveness of the apron. In addition to lead aprons worn by personnel, walls and other physical barriers are utilized to protect radiation workers. Two types of barriers are identified, primary barriers and secondary barriers. Primary barriers are designed to shield personnel and the public from the primary beam. In other words, the wall is positioned perpendicular to the primary beam. Secondary barriers are devices used to shield personnel from scattered radiation and leakage radiation. In general, secondary barriers are positioned parallel to the primary beam. In general, control booths employ secondary barriers. By design, X-ray photons must scatter twice before entering the control booth, according to NCRP Report 105. Unless you are certain that the shielding surrounding the control booth is a primary barrier, make sure that the X-ray tube does not point in the direction of the control booth. Walls, the ceiling, the floor of the floor, uh, radiographic room are also protective barriers. It is essential that radiation exposure through these barriers be kept at a minimum. 
Determination of how much lead equivalent shielding each type of barrier should have is based on a number of variables. First is the workload. Workload calculates the estimated number of patients per week, number of days of the week that the room is in use, the average number of exams per day, and the average number of images per exam, along with the average MA. Next is usage. Usage is a percent. It is the percent of time the beam faces a barrier. For example, consider a room with an upright bucky or a wall or the wall that the beam is directed at when performing to cubes. Next is occupancy factor. Who's on the other side of the barrier? If the radiographic room is on the lowest level, is there anything, I'm sorry, if the radiographic room is on the lowest level, it's not on the lowest level, is there anything on the floor below? Last is distance. Does the tube have the potential to be moved within three feet of that barrier? The final determination of barrier thickness is based on whether the barrier is used in a controlled area or non-controlled area. A controlled area is a space occupied by personnel. This would include, uh, this would include which ex the x-ray control booth. Regulations require that the exposure or dose rate to that area not exceed one millisievert per week or 50 millisievert per year. You may notice that this is the maximum allowable whole body occupational dose. This dose is permissible provided those working in these areas are monitored with radiation dosimeters. Non-controlled areas are areas where the occupancy cannot be controlled. Some examples are patient waiting rooms, front desk reception areas, areas where the general public have access, and offices are often are all classified as non-controlled areas. There's no monitoring in these areas for radiation exposure, meaning the people who occupy them would not be badged. The exposure or dose rate to these areas is not allowed to exceed 0 0.02 millisievert per week or one millisievert per year. This dose represents the annual dose limit for the general population frequently exposed. Again, these areas are not monitored for radiation exposure, though phys physicists will do testing on a routine basis to make sure that the exposure rates are kept uh, to a minimum. There are times when a radiographer cannot be outside of the room during x-ray production. We talked about a few examples like fluoroscopy, portables or mobile imaging or imaging in the OR. During portable imaging, even if the radiographer can stand outside the patient's room, the walls likely do not meet the barrier specifications. For these reasons, Distance and shielding, such as lead aprons, are your friend. Use them as needed to minimize scatter dose to yourself and to those around you. During fluoroscopy, if there's not a reason to be standing close to the patient, stand as far back as possible and minimize the amount of time near the patient. Wear lead aprons, thyroid shields, lead goggles, and other protective equipment during fluoroscopy, and make sure to use lead gloves if your hands are going to be in or near the primary beam, such as if you're trying to help turn the patient or if you need to hold the patient on their side. For mobile imaging, and this includes the C-arm, use the controls that allow you to stand back as much as possible. These controls must be on a cord that is at least six feet long, but preferably 12 feet. Of course, we must still be able to observe our patients. So I'm gonna show you um, on the diagram here, if you watch here, um, you can see as we increase our distance, we obviously are exposed to less radiation. And we can see the further we are away from the uh, radiation source, the lower the radiation dose.
Some other tips to minimize exposure during fluoroscopy. When assisting during tabletop or table side fluoroscopy, try to avoid standing at the head end or foot end of the table or minimize the amount of time in that position if you do have to move into the position. We do have to be able to help our patients and assist the radiologist. Radiation dose is highest at the head end and foot end of the table. If you have to assist the patient, do so quickly and move back out of the way when possible. The safest position for the radiographer when close to the patient is at a 90 degree angle to the patient and when possible, at least one meter or three feet away. Never ever stand in the direct path of the x-ray beam for any reason. If holding a patient for an exposure becomes unavoidable, do so without being in the path of the primary beam. It is preferred that non-occupationally exposed personnel be utilized whenever possible. In a fixed fluoroscopy room that is not a C-arm configuration, the, the x-ray tube is inside the table in a fixed position. With equipment that is a C-arm configuration, including the mobile C-arm devices, where the tube is not in a fixed position, it is always best to have the tube under the table or under the patient and the image intensifier over the table. This helps to reduce dose to personnel at the level of the head and neck where lead coverage does not fully cover the anatomy. Lead aprons, which go to the knees, cover anatomical structures more fully below the table, at least the sensitive structures. Other protective measures include exposure switches, portable extension cords, and the use of the inverse square law. Exposure switches, whether portable or stationary, uh, whether portable or stationary, uh, all equipment use or utilize are the dead man type, the dead man type switches. On stationary units, the switch will be located in such a way that the operator cannot peer out from behind the barrier during an exposure. Moving to the portable exposure cord, it is important to note that the exposure cord must be at least six feet in length in order for the operator to stand at least that far from the patient and the x-ray tube during exposure. After shielding and distance considerations have been taken into account, it may be better to stand 90 degrees from the patient in order to re uh, reduce occupational dose. Pregnant personnel can continue to work, but are urged to inform their employer, receive safety counseling, and wear a second dosimeter at the waist under the lead apron when it is worn in order to monitor the dose to the fetus. Reporting a pregnancy is not mandatory. However, employers are not required to make accommodations if it's not reported. Employees may also rescind their declaration of pregnancy at any time. The second dosimeter, as I mentioned, is typically issued for the fetus. It is to be worn at the waist level under an apron when it's worn. This dosimeter would be used in a case where pregnancy, this, I'm sorry, this dosimeter would not be used in a case where pregnancy is not declared. Recommendations are that the monthly dose to the fetus does not exceed 0 0.05 rem in a month or 0.5 millisievert in a month. Some employers have rules that prevent pregnant individuals from working in certain areas. At times, pregnant workers will declare a pregnancy in the early part of pregnancy when the fetus is more sensitive to exposure to radiation then rescind the declaration later in the pregnancy so that they can return to their normal uh, work rotations. Remember, in the event of pregnancy, provisions are not, or I'm sorry, are made in order uh, for the professional exposure of the pregnant female to be such that the exposure of the unborn child during the time of pregnancy uh, is as low as reasonably possible. 
All proclaimed pregnant personnel shall wear an additional dosimeter at waist level. The purpose of this is to ensure that the monthly equivalent dose to the embryo or fetus does not see, exceed 0.5 millisieverts. There are some exceptions. In a work area, um, you know, maybe not in a hospital setting, but in a work area where there is no fluoroscopy and no chance for the pregnant mother to be in the room, um, then th there might not be a need to issue the second dosimeter. Okay. Here's a list of recommendations for you. Apply these advice advices in your daily routine to reduce, reduce the patient dose and thus reduce the occupational dose. Uh, limit the procedures and the, to the examinations and exposures necessary. Obtain the previous images and parameters used for the examinations. Position the patient using restraints or immobilization devices to reduce the need to hold patients. Use collimation devices a reduction in scatter radiation will therefore uh, improve the quality of the image and ensure uh, enhanced patient and personnel protection. Select the incidences reducing the dose of sensitive organs and decrease the fluoroscopy contribution. Strictly collimate the beam on the region to be examined. Be attentive to automatic collimation systems or positive beam limitation. And also adjust the dimensions of the cassette or the IR when the region examined is small relative to uh, the traditional dimensions, particularly in pediatric radiography. Protect sensitive organs with lead shields. Regularly measure the dose delivered to the patient and, and act if the doses deviate from the recommendations. Compile a quality assurance program and avoid the trend towards overexposure um, assessed by excessive darkening in conventional radiography and by excessively high parameters in digital radiography. We don't always know that something's overexposed when we're uh, in digital radiography. To ensure that shielding calculations and other recommendations are adequate and the radiation dose to the public is below regulatory limits. The pro pro proposed floor plans and shielding need to be submitted to health physics for review and approval as early in the design process as possible to reduce the possible uh, necessity of required design changes. During construction and, renov and or renovations, a shielding equivalent review uh, should be performed by the health physics for areas um, to determine that the areas covered in the shielding calculation report are accurate. So that brings us to the end of section one. In our next section, we will discuss radiation detection and monitoring. Anyone who's likely to receive 10% of the annual occupational dose limit must be issued a dosimeter. The type and the frequency of which it is read is up to the facility issuing the dosimeter. Generally speaking, those individuals exposed to higher doses of radiation in areas such as interventional radiography and cardiac catheterization would have their dosimeters read more frequently. General diagnostic technologists might have theirs read once a year. Let's look at the structure, sensitivity, advantages, and disadvantages of each type listed here. Film badges deserve an honorable mention. After all, this is the original type of dosimeter. The film badge had a piece of film inside, along with filters made of various types of metal, such as copper, aluminum, and tin. The type of metal helped to determine the nature of the exposure reading. For example, was it primary beam or scatter radiation? Film badges needed to be sent out to be read. They then they would provide a legal documented dose report. Film badges were sensitive to about 10 millirem of exposure, which is equivalent to 0.1 millisievert. In addition to the legal dose report, a primary advantage was low cost of use. A primary disadvantage was the susceptibility to environmental elements. Sunlight and heat, for example, 
could be recorded as an exposure. They were also susceptible to being ruined if they got wet, leaving the film badge um, on your scrubs when you do laundry, when doing laundry posed issues. Film badges are pretty much obsolete right now, but they are in use in some, uh, in some instances. The OSL at the present time is the most widely used type of dosimeter. The OSL employs an aluminum oxide detector to capture X-ray photon and gamma, photon, gamma ray photons. Like the film badge, OSLs need to be sent out to be read. It, they are read by, with the use of a laser light, which when directed to the aluminum oxide detector causes the luminescence directly proportional to the amount of radiation received by the dosimeter. OSLs can be worn up for up to a year, but most are read either monthly or quarterly. OSLs are similar to film badges in that they employ aluminum, copper, and tin filters to determine the nature of the radiation exposure, and they provide a legal reading. OSLs are more sensitive than film badges and can measure radiation doses down to one millirem, which is the equivalent of 0 0.01 millisievert. Advantages of the OSL include the, the fact that they are lightweight, they're very durable, and they are not affected by heat, light, or other elements. There are no real disadvantages to the OSL except for those working with radio nuclides because readings cannot be done the same day as an exposure. Depending on the vendor, these dosimeters can be expensive, which is why many companies do the quarterly or yearly monitoring when using OSLs. Next is the TLD. The TLD was very popular as the film badges were faded out, but are not as commonly used as the OSL in today. <clears throat> the TLD has a lithium fluoride crystal, has lithium fluoride crystals which undergo um, a physical change when exposed to radiation. These dosimeters are, also need to be sent out to be read and are read using a heating process using a special device called a TLD analyzer. The TLD presented a few advantages over film badges. Lithium fluoride interacts with radiation much the same way as human tissue, giving a more accurate sense of possible biological effects, while also providing the same sensitivity as a film badge. The TLD badge can be worn for up to three months and can be reused after reading. Initial costs of these devices were higher than um, film badges, but since they can be reused, the cost savings will seen later. The primary disadvantage is they can only be read once, unlike the film badges and the OSL. This means that a legal dose report is not possible. Here we have the pocket ionization chamber. These devices are not useful in diagnostic radiography, but are very beneficial when working with radionuclides. The PIC fits in a shirt or lab coat pocket, much like a pen, and measures the ionizations in air within the chamber. There are two basic types. One is a self-reading, as we see in image A. The other requires an electrometer to read it. Both can provide readings on the spot, meaning that they don't need to be sent out. As you can imagine, that is why these are used in and around radionuclides. The PICs are fairly expensive and they are susceptible to drops and shock. If they are not read daily, they can provide inaccurate readings. Aside from daily readings, the primary advantage is, being, is the fact that it is the most sensitive of all dosimeters. But as I mentioned, they're not effective in diagnostic radiography. The newest thing on the market are the digital dosimeters or, person, or personnel digital ionization dosimeters. 
They utilize an ionization chamber that creates an electrical charge when exposed to radiation. Primary advantage of digital dosimeters are low susceptibility to external factors and the ability to get an, a radiation exposure reading on demand. Some of the newer types of these are um, actually Bluetooth enabled. Users download an app on their phone and anytime they are within a certain proximity of their phone, it'll automatically give them a reading. Other types of US, other types have USB connection and almost look like a flash drive. The USB is connected to a computer to obtain a reading. Other advantages include durability and ability to generate other reports besides radiation exposure, including a detailed history report. The primary disadvantage is cost, but they are reusable and can be reassigned to a new employee when one employee leaves. We looked into these devices recently at, uh, with our program and the initial startup cost was well over $10,000. Another type of monitor used in and around radiology departments, as well as other places, are area radiation monitors. There are a few types, but all work by measuring the amount of ionization detected in the air using an ionization chamber. While these devices do not serve a purpose of monitoring uh, for radiation exposure on individuals, they do offer monitoring protection by measuring radiation one might not know is there. One example is in and around the hot lab, where the, which is the area where pharma, radio pharmaceuticals are stored in imaging departments. Each state has different laws regarding the storage of such materials and regulations would require the frequent survey of the areas for radioactivity. One example of use would be survey Another, area, another example of use would be surveying the area after a spill of radioactive material. In addition, area monitors are used to measure radiation exposure outside of a radiographic room, particularly in uncontrolled areas, or outside of radiation therapy areas to ensure the minimum dose is coming into a controlled area. We might more commonly associate these devices with something one might see after a nuclear disaster such as Chernobyl or Fukushima. Okay, so this was a very quick section. Uh, this brings us to the end of our second section. All right, so we're gonna move into the last part of our, um, of our module where we're going to discuss regulations and agencies which provide guidance and standards to radiation protection. These agencies may vary from state to state and by country to country. We're going to review those that we find um, here in the United States. We have one more question. Ah, that's a great question. Um, so Kimberly's asking where, uh, how many of these types of meetings we have each year. Uh, that varies. So uh, one place that you can find out is by visiting the uh, medical professionals website. Um, and get on their mailing list, and then you'll learn a little bit more. And I know they advertise them on LinkedIn as well. So you can find out inf more information about that because it's a lot of different varieties of topics as well. So there's always something good to choose from. But thank you so much for that question. Appreciate it. All right. So uh, as I said, we're going to review the agencies and so forth that we find in the United States. And sorry about that. All right. So when talking about radiation protection laws, regulations, and guidelines, uh, guidelines are recommendations that are used to create standards, regulations, and laws. Alone, a guideline is not something that is enforceable. Research leads to these guidelines being set. For example, the National Council on Radiation Protection, or the, NRCP, the NCRP, makes recommendations for the annual dose limit for radiographers based on research of the cancer-causing ability of radiation. From there, these, uh, there are regulatory agencies um, that would create standards of what is acceptable. If warranted, a law or regulation may be created to ensure the safe practice of working with radiation. In the United States, these the three levels of US regulations exist to protect American citizens from harm harmful effects of radiation. These are 
federal laws which address um, issues on a national level. One example is the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. The FDA creates regulations related to equipment that produces ionizing radiation such as the minimum amount of filtration required for the x-ray tube that we discussed earlier. OSHA creates regulations that require employers to provide radiation protection equipment to their employees. These regulations are enforceable by laws that require the regulations be followed and can result in fines or loss of practice, license, uh, practice licenses as deemed necessary. Statutes are state laws that are enforceable at the state level. An example might be a state licensure to practice radiography. There is no requirement that states have any kind of licensure. So consider this, the ART has standards to determine clinical competence. However, the ART is not a regulatory agency and absent a federal law or a state law requiring that someone be credentialed through the ART, a state, law, a state that, does, that does not have licensure allows for anyone to take x-rays. State licensure provides this, that statute which is enforceable at the state level. In order to protect patient safety, in order to protect patient safety and assure only qualified individuals operate radiation producing equipment. The last level of regulation is an ordinance, which applies to regulations at a local level. There may be an ordinance in place to prohibit nuclear reactors from being built. In addition, some of the state and national regulations are shared with local areas. An example of this would be building inspectors who assure that the federal agencies that who assure the federal agencies that the protective thicknesses of the barriers in the walls of the radiographic rooms meet the required special specifications. Administrative laws are those laws that govern the formation and operation of administrative agencies and the rulings made by administrative made by the administrative agencies. They are created by a unit of executive branch of government, either the federal or the state level. All administrative law is run through government agencies. Our government is made up of numerous administrative agencies. Agencies can be federal, state, city, or county entities. Administrative regulations are generally upheld in court when challenged. The Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR, is the codification of the general and permanent rules and regulations called administrative law. Published in the Federal Register by the executive departments and agencies of the federal government of the United States. In other words, this is a body of federal regulations which have been cataloged into many volumes. The regulations most important to radiation protection are specified on the following slides. Here we have a table that summarizes the most important federal US regulations and relative, le relative legislative authority. It should be noted if any attendees are planning to take the ART board exam, questions on these laws might be on your exam. One of the first significant laws related to radiation is 10 CFR 20 or the Atomic Energy Act of 1954, which established the Atomic Energy Commission, now known as the NRC. This agency came to be after World War II when, and the atomic bombings in Japan. The main purpose of this agency is to establish regulations to enforce protection from ionizing radiation. The next significant piece of legislation is 21 CFR 1, subchapter sub J, otherwise known as the Radiation Control for Health and Safety Act of 1968. As I mentioned, the FDA creates regulations related to the safety standards of radiation producing equipment. This act created the agency within the FDA and provides them with the authority to regulate and enforce these standards. Next is the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, or 29 CFR 
1910.1096, which created OSHA. The primary responsibility of OSHA is workplace safety. Last but, and not limited to radiation safety. Last but not least is 42 CFR 1 part 75, the Consumer Patient Radiation Health and Safety Act of 1981, which establishes standards for educational training of radiographers and other healthcare workers who operate equipment that produces ionizing radiation. You may think, wait a minute, she said there are no federal laws requiring somebody to be certified by ART. There are not. This just sets the standards. Other agencies oversee the standards such as ART, ASRT, and the JRC ERT. And that is why it is very important to be sure to attend a program that is JRC ERT accredited. This means the program meets the minimum standards and follows the ASRT curriculum. We saw on the first three slide, for, on the first three, um, on the previous slide, in addition, some are, um, that are more recent as far as activity goes includes the Mammography Quality Standards Act of 1992, signed into law by Bill Clinton. MQSA charges the Department of Health and Human Services with establishing and maintaining a comprehensive program to review and certification of mammography imaging centers, equipment, and personnel, physicians, health physicists, and technologists. The American Society of Radiologic Technologists, along with its state affiliates, is nearing its 17th year lobbying to change the law to require mandatory licensing standards for all 50 states. This is called the CARE Act. You may have heard about it. Pennsylvania, where I reside, is one of only about seven states that do not require licensure, though there are some other requirements in place. Licensure ensures that individuals are deemed competent by the ART, which means they have met strict educational and clinical requirements and passed a national registry board exam. The Joint Commission on Healthcare does does require individuals working in a joint commission accredited hospital to be credentialed. However, doctor's offices, urgent care centers, and hospitals not accredited can hire individuals who are not competent and have not completed the appropriate education and met the appropriate um, proof of competency. That's in Pennsylvania or any other licensure state. Almost all states do require that anyone working in radiography be ARRT credentialed. One exception that I'm aware of is Alabama. The state of Alabama, there is no educational requirement to work in radiography. They do have schools. They do you know, have JRC approved schools. They have technologists who are ART credentialed, but you don't have to be. Some states go further than uh, the ART and require additional education and or testing to operate radio radiographic equipment, such as California and Alaska. Please note that today, each state has its own individual laws and regulations and establishes individual acts. Non-governmental organizations also play a role in radiation protection. Some of these include the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurement, or the NCRP. The NCRP was established in 1931 and chartered in 1964. It recommends to Congress and the states specific dose measurement limits. The National Research Council, administered by the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineers, and the Institute of Medicine, produced the BEIR, the Bayer reports. The latest report was Bayer 5, health effects of exposure to low levels of ionizing radiation. And the International Commission of Radiolog Radiologic Protection, or the ICRP, started in 1928 and functions similarly to the NCRP. It promotes cooperation in research, data collection, and effective use of combined resources. 
At the institutional level, when radioactive material or radiation producing equipment is used, a radiation safety officer or RSO is required. The RSO is responsible for establishing a radiation safety program, including protocols and policies to ensure safe practices at that level. The radiation safety officer can be a physicist, a radiologist, or a radiographer with the proper training. What other organizations are involved in radiation protection in the United States? The United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, or UNSCEAR, is a quasi-governmental agency established in 1955 by Resolution 913 of the United Nations General Assembly. The UN Scientific Committee reports on issues related to exposure to humans and the environment to ionizing radiation to the General Assembly. It provides scientific basis for radiation protection and evaluation of risks. Say what you will about regulations. I know a lot of people that complain about them, maybe not in our field, but in others, but they are necessary. Prior to much of this legislation, regulations, um, legislation and regulations, safety was a huge concern in our, um, in our profession. The leukemia rates among radiation workers was 50, 40%, I'm sorry, 40% higher than what it is today. So consider the fact that x-rays were discovered in 1895. It wasn't until the 1940s, in the United States at least, that minimum standards for radiation protection equipment and units of measure for radiation exposure to workers were widely accepted. And I'll leave, that, I'll leave you with that thought.